And now for the last part of the Christians at the Capitol Day with Kent Ostrander and Dr. Frank Simon. Instead of having moms and dads caring for her, brothers and sisters, she had men using her. I can't get comprehend that. There'll be pro-life bills that we need to pass. Kentucky could be a leading pro-life state. There are only six other states that are limited to one abortion clinic. We're down to one abortion clinic. Kentucky could be one of those states that breaks free. I'm not trying to say we need to be number one because that means it's all about us. We're number one. God, we want to be number one. No, that's not the case. But we need to stop abortion, the killing of unborn. The lottery, of course, was first passed, constitutional amendment. The Kentuckians voted for it, and it was going to help education. All the money was just thrown into the, the general fund. So half the money went to education because half the budget goes into education, but the other half is spent elsewhere. Finally, the legislature backed up and said, oh, we, we said it was going to go into education. Let's put it into education. They put it into scholarships. I'm all for scholarships, but think about it. Who plays the lottery? Is it the wealthy or the poor? The poor. Okay. Who goes to college? The middle class and the upper class. So we have built an institution that says, let's take money from the poor so that the middle class and upper class can go to college for less. Now, that's just wrong. It's just wrong. So anyway, we're not going to discuss the lottery because there's no bills talking about the lottery, but it's just a stupid concept. And a, a governor ran on it and, uh, and uh, ran on its campaign and won. Okay, we might as well get started. My name is Frank Simon. I'm the state director of the American Family Association. I'm a medical doctor. I got saved about 40 years ago. <laughs> it seems like God has showed me that there are a lot of problems in our country, our state, that we as Christians need to be aware of and to try to help correct them. There's a verse, verse of scripture that says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Okay, so we're going to try to talk about something that's going to keep us from perishing. I want to talk with you about this article. It's called Judicial Watch Special Report Exposing the Deep State. How many people heard of Judicial Watch? That's a lot. How many people heard of the deep state? It's also called the shadow government, bureaucracy. I'm making up some of that, but anyway. So this is a, a group of people that are speaking on the deep state. There's a, an MC and four panelists. And the first one is Sebastian Gorka. And he is a national security specialist. He says that he was working on the Trump campaign at one time for about six months, and he asked for some, he was a professor, and he asked for some of his students to be brought in, to be in his office, and be employed. The State Department, it doesn't say what department, but some department said, oh no, we're not going to let them in, they're too conservative. I mean, I kind of filled that in, but they didn't let him have them. So, not only did they not let him have them to work with him, but they basically had them in their whatever job they were in, he had them lowered in that job. So they were given a less significant job wherever they were. He says, to quote, a senior individual looks at the White House as the enemy. There are people in the government in the bureaucracy that have been there for many, many years. And they say it started with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and they've been hanging on, okay, and when a Republican gets elected, or then they, they hang around. They get a job, they get a house, and they stay there in the government and keep working. And if a Republican comes in, and they may get a few jobs, but when the Republican president or Congress leaves, then they go home, go back to their old job. But the Democrats and the liberals hang around there and stay there. Now, he says, something like 98% of the people in Washington, D.C. voted for Hillary. Then there are what they call bedroom communities around Washington, D.C., and 80 plus percent of them voted for Hillary too. And they stay on and they become part of the bureaucracy and they have their own agenda. So he says, this is Gorka says, he worked with several agencies. 
they they couldn't get much done because of these left wingers that were in the government. The next speaker is Diana West, who wrote a book called American Betrayal: The Secret Assault on Our Nation's Character. And she goes on and says, "Well." This is unconstitutional for these bureaucrats to try to run the show. So there's no balance of power. Here he says, the same force is unaccountable to the people. Okay, America's supposed to be of the people, for the people, by the people. But these guys say, uh-uh, we're running the show. And we're going to do what we want. No matter who's elected or who's the president, they got their own agenda. This lady says, I would credit Judicial Watch and WikiLeaks as being essential to exposing what we see of the deep state. But I think it's very important to remember that it was Donald Trump himself who provoked the deep state into exposing itself. We can see this when we look at just what we've learned about the outrageous effort of the CIA and FBI and the NSA, which is National Security Agency and CIS Central Intelligence Agency. Okay, so they're saying, here comes Hillary. She pays millions of dollars to get him to write this dossier about Trump. It's all made up. There wasn't true. And the FBI takes, oh, yeah, this is important. We're going to go to FICA and get permission to bug all of these Trump cabinet members and find out what they did and didn't do and then anything comes up we're going to leak it to the press they got an agenda candidate trump first provoked the deep state into the open with a specific set of forbidden issues immigration restriction trump wants to restrict immigration well here comes the immigrants a lot of them are muslim but they come from more or less third world world countries, and they are entry-level workers. So they don't have much education. They work for very little money. They take the jobs of a lot of people that are trying to just get by. Big business likes these guys. They say, well, come on in, bring all the low-paying workers you can get so that you have a job, and and you say, well, I'd like a raise. Oh, no, I can get 10 other people over here to do your job. You're not getting any raise. Shut up and sit down, okay? So as long as they got a big flood of people around that will work for less, you're never going to get a raise, okay? Because they, and big business likes it that way. They want a lot of low-income people hanging around so that they can put pressure on you and me to not try to, get ahead in the world. They say, oh, no, we're going to bring one of these guys in and take your job. What's more, like we may make you train the new guy before you leave. They did that. Okay, so restricted immigration, they're working on that. Real respectable presidential candidate never even mentioned them. Okay, the other candidates didn't mention, but Trump, whoop, he came right out. Hey, we're going to put America first. And we're going to get America working before we bring in all of these people from all over the world to get their jobs. These issues had been essentially taken from us by the powers that always seemed to be. They were settled and they didn't want Trump bringing that stuff up. He said, look, we're running the show. We want a lot of low paid people in here for workers. So he brought up the forbidden issues. They don't want that to even be discussed. Sessions. Senator Sessions, that's the Attorney General, he had a whole speech about that. He says, not fair. Why are you bringing in all these people? We're bringing in more people now than you've ever had before. He says, we need Americans to get their jobs and not a thousand other people from all over the world. And the Muslims, they're soft on Islam because, well, it says here later on, but these deep state people, they're big on globalism, one world government. Read the book of Revelation, and the Antichrist is in charge of a one-world government with a world religion, and that's the way these bureaucrats are thinking. I don't know how they put it all together. I'm sure they didn't read the Bible, but that's the way they want it. Somehow they got it all together. I guess they're all serving the, the devil. 
and he says they're putting together the building blocks of a socialist paradise. In the book of Acts, they had a kind of a socialistic government, and they gave everybody whatever they needed, and they just went around and sold their property so that they could get the money. And But when push came to shove, it didn't work. They had to get everybody go and work for themselves. See, they thought Jesus was coming back in a few days, and they thought, well, we'll just keep everybody going for a while, but it didn't work out. Then the pilgrims came. They had a socialist government. They said, okay, we're going to take care of everybody, and when you feel like it, you go out in the field and work, and guess what? They half starved to death, so it didn't work then, and then after a while, they said, okay, we're going to give you 10 acres, we're going to give you 10 acres, and you 10 acres, and we get out there and make it work. And everybody went out there and worked day and night and overtime and everything to make enough money for their families. And they made it work. And it worked out. That's what you call free enterprise. And it works. And the socialism doesn't work. But they're this bureaucracy. They're basically socialists and one-worlders. And the socialist paradise doesn't work. But they're still trying to try it. Well, let's try it one more time. So he's saying that these are all left-wingers that are in the bureaucracy. Like I said, they all voted for Hillary, almost all of them. She says there's evidence, hard evidence, that there are hundreds if not thousands of Soviet agents all around the halls of power in Washington. And they've been there since Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt. Then another guy who's a reporter for the Washington Examiner, sort of a conservative newspaper, and he says, the American people are paying more attention now. To, so they say, oh, yeah, Trump had 17 girlfriends. Well, who said so? And they question it. They're not going to believe everything ABC, CBS, NBC, and CNN says. They're going to say, well, where did you get that idea? They want to know where you get your information. Okay, he says, if the government or a liberal newspaper like the New York Times or the Washington Post want the phone logs, who have you been calling? They get it within a matter of days. But if a conservative reporter wants to find that same information, they can't get it. It'll take them a year if they ever get it. That's because the bureaucracy doesn't want to cooperate with anybody that's conservative, which means to believe in the Constitution and free enterprise. The Constitution is the American people's way of telling the government what it can and cannot do. That's the way it's supposed to be, but it doesn't work that way all the time. Here's another one of Judicial Watch's lawyers. Even though a new president and new perspectives on things are in Washington now, nothing changes. We still have an IRS with a holdover commissioner in place. Lois Lerner never got prosecuted for her outrageous abuses that occurred there. We have open acknowledgement, nobody even trying to hide that the EPA and other federal agencies, they're using encrypted cell phone technology to communicate with other federal employees, and which is an open violation of the law. Okay, so there's a lot of hanky-panky going on there that they hang together and they won't let you prosecute them. That's because they're part of the permanent state. Now, say you find somebody over here that leaked an important national security secret. Well, he said, we're going to prosecute. Well, you can't prosecute him because he can appeal. He said, we're going to fire you. Well, he can appeal that over and over and over and over and over for maybe a year or so. In the meanwhile, he's still getting paid. Trump tried to find a, to pass a new situation in the VA where it says they only going to give them limited appeals and they're not going to pay them while they're under investigation. So that's that's a good thing. It says, well, when the Democrats win, they get all these bureaucratic positions filled with left-wingers. And when they lose and the Republicans come in, well, those Democrats hang on. They don't go home. But if a Republican gets elected, then the Republican brings in some people but when he leaves, they all go back home again. They don't stick around and become part of the bureaucracy. What I think is disheartening to people as they see Koskinen still 
in the IRS. He was in charge of the conservatives, the Tea Party people. If they wanted to get tax exempt status, they went on for a year or more. And they, they discriminated against any conservatives. Okay, he says, on November 8, a scrappy group of conservatives got in, but it's hard to keep it going. <laughs> there is the establishment running are wickets. In other words, if you try to get them to do something, they, they don't want to do it. So there's like a fourth branch of government. You've got the executive branch, the judicial branch, the legislative branch, and then you've got this bureaucracy, which has its own agenda, and they're not going to cooperate. The FBI is paying for the expert behind the dossier. All those false information they made up by Trump, even the FBI kicked in some money to keep it going. And they shouldn't have been doing that. Here's Lois Lerner and the IRS. They're still hanging around there. There's an establishment on the right and an establishment on the left that has a sharp shared philosophy and has done it so for 20 or 30 years. Not because they're communists, but because they believe in the same thing that Hillary was talking about when she told the bankers in Brazil, she said, we don't need no stinking borders in this hemisphere. Okay, she wants people to come in, bring all their drugs by a truckload, and give them to your children and mine, and say, oh yeah, we'll get you all the heroin and Lortab and marijuana you want, and it's just pennies. We'll keep it cheap so you can get all the dope you want. And all the terrorists come, come in hand in hand across the border. So this dossier, Hillary paid for it, and then I think the FBI picked up some of the bills. And, but the whole thing was made up wrong. Here's the James R. Clapper, the director of national intelligence, and he said that he wanted everybody to know what was in that dossier. Well, he shouldn't have done that. It was Hillary's campaign material, and it was false. And here's the director of the national intelligence agency spreading all this false information about Trump. Comey said he let some of that information, some information out. What I'm saying, I'm going to sum it all up, there are problems in Washington. We can war vote and get our people in there, and then there, there's a whole deep state or bureaucracy or shadow government in there, and they've been in there since Roosevelt and they're trying to build themselves up. They're all backing the left-wingers, and they're going to more or less do what they want. And here comes Judicial Watch that says, well, we want all the emails on Hillary. Well, they said, we ain't giving them to you. So he said, he goes to court and gets the judge. There's still some honest judges say, hey, we're going to put every one of you in the State Department in jail if you don't get those emails to us. Well, then here they come. There's yeah. emails come out. It's like pulling teeth. He has to, and you know, all of that is expensive. So what's the answer to all of this? The answer is you and me and everybody that cares about the things of God and the Constitution and free enterprise, we got to work together. Okay. Now here's Target. Target says, oh, yeah, we're going to let all the men into the girls' restroom and changing room. They're all taking pictures and everything. They say, well, we're going to do it anyway. And so here comes Tim Wildman and the American Family Association out of Tupelo, Mississippi. And they say, oh, listen, these guys are crooks and they shouldn't be letting men into the girls' restroom. Push came to shove. They just lost 13% of their stock went down a month or so ago. The thing is, they had a million people that got on a petition and they told everybody, hey, Target is trying to get men in the women's restroom. And so now people stop going in there and finally they are in a heap of trouble because they doing crazy things. But the media is never going to come out and tell you that. So if it wasn't for Tim Wildman and the American Family Association, that probably never would have come up. But he got all these people. Now, what I'm trying to say is, you and me, you are important. I can't do it. 
I've been trying for 30 years to do something. You can't do it. I can't do it. But guess what? If we work together, we can do it. Senate Bill 17 passed a year ago, and that put prayer back in Kentucky schools. And we went around and got signatures. We got 100,000 people signed that petition. Do you want God back in the public schools? And they said, yeah. So guess what? When it came up for a vote, we called 100,000 people and said, hey, Senate Bill 17 is coming up for a vote. Call this number, 1-800-73, whatever it is, and tell them to vote for Senate Bill 17. Well, one guy said, I got more balls on that bill than any other bill. That's because everybody got in on the action. Now, Eileen isn't here. She and Cindy put out an email every day. We listen to Heritage Foundation, Tea Party Patriots, and there are people out there that will tell you what's going on in Washington. And we listen to all those conference calls and everything and put out an email about once a week. If you can give us an email address, they'll email you that. And all you have to do is punch on the little button that says action. And you punch on that, it'll automatically send a letter. And you don't have to know who your U.S. senator is or your U.S. congressman or your state senator or your state congressman representative. Poof, that's all done by the computer. So if you can give us all that information now, I think they've got these over here, don't they? You do that, nothing can stop the work of God. Nothing can. That's in the Bible. It says, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Okay? We can do it. With God's help, there are four big miracles that occurred in the last two years. Number one, Kim Davis. You remember Kim Davis? They put her in jail, said, oh, listen, if you're a Christian, we're going to lock you up. If you don't sign these same-sex marriage certificates, you know, I don't think God wants me to. So they locked her up, and the next day, there were 10,000 Christians at that jailhouse, and the state police had to close the exit because there's no place for anybody to park. And the next day, the judge said, hey, you know what? I'm going to let this girl go. That was one miracle. The next miracle was Matt Bevan got elected for governor. I remember going to bed that night and they say, he hadn't got a chance. He'll lose by six points. And when the dust settled in the morning, he won by a huge landslide. There are people that voted that had never voted before. And he won by a huge landslide. That was another miracle. And then there was another miracle. They flipped the house here in Frankfurt. That was a miracle. It hadn't happened for 90 years. And it happened then. Why? God came on the scene and he made it happen. And then some people would say Trump's election was another. Therefore, God is doing miracles. And if we pray and ask God to help us and register to vote and get on these mailings and work together, we can do it with God's help. He said, if my people will carve on my name, will get together and work and turn from their apathy. We can do it, and we can do it. Now, I want to give you one other thing. I got another three minutes. This is a Bible tract. It says there are two ways through life, my way and God's way. I can do what I think is good for Frank Simon, and I can turn around and say, well, I'm going to marry the person God wants me to marry. I'm going to get the job God wants me to have. I'm going to do both the way God wants me to, and I can put God first. Let's get on the bandwagon. Does everybody have one of these? This is the name that makes the blind to see, makes the lame to walk opens prison doors, and sets the captives free. Hallelujah. Everybody needs this. You see there's a phone number on here, 502-893-2444. That's my phone number. If you call that, we'll send you enough for everybody in your church. Okay? Is that fair? Free. It's all free. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Okay? We can do it. This is a symbol. It means everything. When you see people walking, driving down the road, and they have this on their car, you can put it on your bumper, or you can put it, tape it to the back window on the inside. 
you can do a lot of things with it, and everybody ought to have that because that's a symbol. What else have I got here? That's it. Here's booklets. These are booklets when Senate Bill 17 passed, put prayer back in the school. These are Christian courses that we can put in the school. You can put in your churches for the young people. The Southern Baptists did a study and said that something like 90% of their people lost their faith in God when they went away to college. Why is that? Because they're not learning about creation, evolution. They're getting brainwashed on that. They're not learning about apologetics. Why is the Bible true? How can you prove the Bible is true? How can you prove that the tomb is empty? that Jesus rose from the dead. It's all provable. There's lots of good evidence. Well, we need to know that evidence, and so do those young people. So when those professors come up here and say, oh, well, there's no truth, the, the Bible's not true. We need to be able to say, yes, it is. And the other one we have is American history. Petitions and put a note on there. We want the course on American history. We'll get it to you because it's important. Lord, we thank you for each one of these people that are here today. We know they're not here by accident, but you brought them here, and you've got a reason for them to be here. We pray that you would bless them, encourage them. Uh, we're talking about until 17, you know, and personally, I can mean, talk to you just a minute about this and give you a brief comment about until 17 with prayer back in Kentucky School. You know, Florida, Mississippi, and Louisiana have already put prayer back in their school, and we can do it too. Prayer was taken out of our schools about 1962. That raises the question, who put prayer in our schools in the first place? Yep. Well, the answer is the founding fathers who wrote the Constitution right. are the ones that put prayer into our schools in the first place. Then the anti-God people said, oh, this is terrible. Children are learning about God. So they told that it was really illegal and unconstitutional for them to take prayer out of the school. But they took it out, took Christianity out of the public schools and put humanism in. They took our religion out and put their religion in. Right. And now they're teaching Islam in our public schools. Yeah. Right. Yeah. America used to have the best schools in the planet, yes. yep. and we were number one. Now, since they took prayer out of school, we brought, brought, brought to 30, I'm uh, sorry, 23rd, and falling all the time. Why did that happen? Because we told God we didn't need it anymore. Right. Right. The other thing. 